Hello, uh, my name is Bill Middleton. I'm a professor of radiology at the Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology um, at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, United States. Today I'm going to be uh, speaking about uh, pearls and pitfalls of abdominal Doppler. So we're going to divide uh, pearls and pitfalls of abdominal Doppler into two basic categories. Um, first will be um, specific anatomic um, areas of the abdomen. And we'll talk about a little bit of anatomy and physiology that can um, cause pitfalls. And we'll go through this list of um, structures. And then we'll uh, shift gears and talk specifically about some technical parameters and things that can cause pitfalls with various uh, measurements and interpretations. But we're going to start with the portal vein. Um, and one of the more common pitfalls in evaluating the portal vein is slow portal venous flow. Um, it can cause false positive diagnoses of portal vein thrombosis, or at the least, can cause an inconclusive Doppler examination. Um, and the pearl, when dealing with that, is mesenteric augmentation. Um, it's based on the same principle as we use in augmenting venous flow in the lower extremity. You basically just push on the lower abdomen over the area of the uh, bowel, which augments flow in the mesenteric vein and increases flow in the portal vein. In addition to this, you can consider doing postprandial scans in patients with slow portal venous flow to augment portal venous flow and make it easier to identify. Now here is an example of a patient where at baseline we could see no flow within the main portal vein. But when augmentation was performed in the lower abdomen, enough uh, uh, flow velocity increase occurred that it was possible to see flow in that portal vein. And this is something that can help you occasionally in these uh, borderline cases. Another pitfall related to the portal vein is development of periportal collaterals. Now, as you know, these occur in the setting of portal vein thrombosis, usually chronic portal vein thrombosis, although they can start to develop with, um, in 6 to 20 days of a thrombosed portal vein. Now, generally, they're seen as multiple tortuous vessels um, in the portal, in the porta hepatis with detectable venous flow on Doppler analysis. Um, but occasionally, if the portal vein is atretic um, and very difficult to visualize, and there's a single large collateral um, that can simulate a patent portal vein. Now, the pearl in this case is that collaterals almost always form anterior to the portal vein and the hepatic artery, um, and that location can help you when you think that you might be dealing with um, a collateral versus a patent portal vein. And then also, the collaterals are usually more tortuous, although when there's a single straight collateral, that's when you get into trouble. But this diagram sort of shows the anatomy that you have with an atretic thrombosed portal vein and a collateral anterior to the portal vein in the hepatic artery. And here's an example where the diagnosis was missed. You can see in the uh, porta hepatis that there's a uh, hepatic artery and a portal vein. This is hepatic artery, and this is what looks like at least the patent portal vein. Now when you look at the waveform within this vessel, you can see that it's a fairly monophasic venous waveform that looks for all intents and purposes like a patent main portal vein. But notice in this case that it's located anterior to the hepatic artery. That's your clue that this probably is not a, uh, a normal portal vein and that what you're dealing with at least potentially is a single preportal collateral. Now another artifact that occurs um, potentially in all veins but particularly uh, is problematic in the portal vein is blooming artifact. Resolution in color Doppler is lower than it is with grayscale um, and because of this the Doppler signal typically extends over adjacent soft tissues and can obscure the vessel wall and in any uh, potential intraluminal abnormality such as non-obstructive thrombus. So if you have a thrombose portal vein and you do, or partially thrombose portal vein, and you do Doppler, the signal can completely obscure the um, uh, intraluminal thrombus. So the pearl in this case is simply to be aware of this 
uh, potential pitfall. And when you are doing an examination for suspected portal vein thrombosis, it's very critical to use a combination of both color Doppler and grayscale to make your um, analysis. So here's an example of a portal vein on color Doppler looks entirely uh, normal with no uh, intraluminal abnormalities. But when you look at that same portal vein without the color um, um, signal, you can see that there's um, fairly extensive non-obstructive thrombus. Now another uh, potential pitfall in the portal vein is the presence of helical blood flow. Now this is not all that uncommon. In fact, a study uh, uh, that was done at um, Kansas showed that 20% of patients with chronic liver disease, these are pre-liver transplant patients, had an area of helical flow um, in the region of the portal bif bifurcation. Now not only in, in chronic liver disease do you see it, but you can also see it in normal patients, albeit at a much lower uh, percentage. Now, it tends to be uh, particularly uh, common in patients that have had TIPS shunts that are status post-liver transplants or in patients with uh, portal vein stenosis. Um, the problem is that on uh, Doppler analysis, this helical blood flow can sometimes simulate flow reversal. And the pearl in this case is don't just rely on grayscale and pulse Doppler. If you use color Doppler, you'll be able to see this area of flow reversal and be able to um, um, confirm that it isn't throughout the portal vein by looking at the more peripheral veins um, in the uh, liver. So here's an example of a patient with a, a fairly prominent main portal vein. And on this Doppler waveform, it looks for all intents and purposes like the blood flow is going in the wrong direction. But when you look at color Doppler, it's fairly easy to see that this is really just an area of localized um, helical blood flow. And while there is reverse flow in this area, the main, uh, uh, main portal vein flow is going in an antegrade direction, which is easy to determine by looking at this more peripheral segment here. Now we're going to move on to the um, renal artery. And one uh, pitfall with uh, evaluating the renal arteries is identifying the location of the abnormality in patients that have parvus tardis um, waveform changes. So we know that um, with renal artery stenosis, which usually occurs at the origin of the renal artery, that you can have uh, alteration in the distal waveform that's referred to as a parvus tardis. Now most of the time when you see a parvus tardis waveform in the renal artery, that's due to uh, atherosclerotic stenosis at the origin. But it can really be due to a stenosis anywhere proximal to where you're measuring the vessel. So in fibromuscular dysplasia, it may occur in the midrenal artery. But remember, it can also occur in the proximal aorta. So it can occur secondary to valvular stenosis or secondary to coarctation or other um, um, forms of aortic stenosis. So the pearl in this case is um, when you see parvus tardis waveforms, recognize that they can occur um, anywhere proximal and that if they do occur in the aorta, they're going to affect more than just one renal artery. So here's an example of a patient that has a parvus tardis waveform um, in the right renal artery. But notice in this case, there's also a similar parvus tardis waveform in the left renal artery. So potentially this patient can have bilateral renal artery stenosis. But as you look further, you can see that the superior mesenteric artery is abnormal, the celiac um, origin is abnormal, and this tells you that there's something proximal to all of these vessels, um, potentially aortic st valvular stenosis. Um, but when you look at the uh, vessels in the upper body, the common carotid arteries are normal bilaterally, and the brachial arteries are normal bilaterally. So this stenosis has to be located someplace between the aortic valve and the renal arteries, and in this case it was um, located at the, um, at, at, it was a coarctation located just distal to the left subclavian. Now another potential pitfall with the renal arteries is confusing flow in the left renal vein for flow in the right renal artery. If you look at the diagram here, you can see that there's an area uh, between the IVC and the aorta where flow in the left renal vein is very close to flow in the right renal artery. And since they're both going in the same direction, it can potentially cause um, confusion. 
Now the pearl in this case is to realize that venous pulsations, um, when they occur, are different from arterial pulsations. It's just, it's just a completely different morphology. And the waveform morphology in the renal artery should be fairly similar in all segments. Um, and it shouldn't differ dramatically between the origin and the mid and distal portion of the renal artery, as would occur if you're confusing the left renal vein flow for right renal artery origin flow. So here's an example where we can see the left renal vein um, emptying into the inferior vena cava. And you can see the left renal vein um, goes anterior to the aorta. This is the right renal artery um, heading away from the aorta and behind the IVC. And you can see how close together those two vessels are and how they're both going in the same direction. Now waveform analysis from those vessels will show that the left renal vein uh, waveform, although it is uh, uh, pulsatile, has a completely different pulsatility than the pulsatility in the right renal artery. And that should be a clue that you're dealing with renal vein flow rather than arterial flow. Just to show you that this uh, truly is a, a potential pitfall, this is an exam that one of my sonographers did. And these uh, images are very magnified. But this is what she initially thought was the right renal artery origin. And it's going um, in the right direction when compared to the mid-right renal artery. But look at the difference in the morphology of these waveforms. This is venous pulsations as opposed to arterial pulsations. Now another uh, arterial uh, uh, pitfall in the kidneys that can occur particularly in transplants um, is due to probe pressure. And remember that renal transplants are in a very superficial location, so it's easy to compress the parenchyma with the uh, transducer. And when you do that, um, you uh, depress arterial flow to a greater extent than you uh, depress systolic flow. So this can result in an abnormally elevated resistive index. Now the pearl in this case is to suspect that this is the case when you have RIs that vary in a transplant from one location to the other or from one time to another. And just alert the, per the people that are doing uh, the exams that they need to have a, uh, a light hand and not use excessive pressure when doing renal transplants. So this is an example of a renal transplant, very thin individual, very superficial transplant. And uh, at one point in the examination, you can see that the arterial waveform from the transplant looks entirely normal. But at another point in the examination, you can see that the waveform looks extremely abnormal with complete absence of end diastolic flow. And this was entirely due to variations in transducer pressure. Another pitfall that can occur with the renal artery is situations where your Doppler um, signal has simultaneous venous and arterial flow. And we call this venous arterial contamination. Um, and when that happens, the venous flow can potentially simulate diastolic flow reversal. Now, if you're dealing with a renal transplant, diastolic flow reversal can be a sign of renal vein thrombosis. The pearl in this case is to look for um, simultaneous flow above and below the baseline that occurs in systole and simultaneously occurs in diastole. As we see here, there's flow below the baseline in um, systole. There's also flow below the baseline and above the baseline in diastole. Um, that would not happen with the to and fro pattern that you get with renal vein thrombosis. And then in addition, if you compare the venous, the isolated venous waveform with the suspected um, diastolic flow reversal from an arterial waveform, you can see that they're identical. Now here's a couple of examples. These are actually in native kidneys. But you can see this waveform on the left looks very much like a to and fro waveform with antegrade flow in systole and retrograde flow in diastole. But notice that there's also some antegrade flow in diastole here that overlaps with this apparent retrograde flow. That tells you that this is not really a uh, true uh, uh, example of a to and fro waveform. The same thing is present here where we have a little bit of reversal from, or a little bit of ve uh, venous flow that occurs during systole and overlaps the antegrade systolic flow. And this venous flow 
overlaps the anterograde diastolic flow. Now this truly is a pitfall. This is an example above of to and fro flow in a patient with um, renal transplant venous thrombosis. And you notice that there's systolic flow above the baseline and there's diastolic flow below the baseline, but they never um, occur simultaneously. And this is an example from um, the literature where this was um, uh, reported as diastolic flow reversal. But I think if you look real carefully, this in fact is probably an example of contaminated um, arterial signal with venous flow. Now we're going to move on to the hepatic artery. Um, and you can get this same um, pitfall with hepatic artery waveforms where the portal venous signal overlaps with the hepatic arterial signal. And when that happens, it can, leave to, it can lead to a uh, uh, misinterpretation of the arterial waveform. And in particular, it can cause problems with measuring hepatic artery uh, resistive indices. So you can see here, when the portal venous waveform is added to the arterial waveform, the portal venous waveform can obscure diastolic flow um, and make it difficult to measure an accurate RI. So the pearl in this case is decrease your sample volume size as much as possible so you're either sampling the artery or the vein, but not both simultaneously. Move your sample volume around, and if you still can't eliminate this um, overlap, then just select a different hepatic artery to sample from. So here's an example. We can see a portal triad here with both portal venous and hepatic arterial flow. This is what the portal venous signal looks like. This is what the initial hepatic artery signal looked like. It looked like there was a fair amount of diastolic flow. But notice that this diastolic flow is exactly the same as this portal venous flow. And this is actually due to the uh, phenomenon that we were just uh, discussing. Now when we uh, were very careful and tried to really isolate that hepatic artery, you can see there truly is some diastolic flow here, but it's a little less than the um, portal venous flow. So the measurement of the RI here would be correct. The measurement of the RI here would be incorrect. Now another potential pitfall that can affect the hepatic artery and, and can affect other arteries for that matter is uh, patients that have left ventricular assist devices. These can produce very abnormal waveforms that simulate a parvus tardis waveform. And this is important when you're evaluating liver transplants or hepatic artery, um, uh, potential hepatic artery injuries, because parvus tardis waveforms would be a positive finding in both of those situations. Now, LVADs that are non-pulsatile will cause a marked blunting of the arterial signal. And this can not only um, simulate arterial stenosis, but it can even simulate um, venous flow because it looks so monophasic. So the pearl in this case is recognize when the waveform looks extremely abnormal that you may be dealing with a patient that has a LVAD. Um, look at other arteries because all of the arteries will be affected um, similarly. And then simply uh, pull up a, a chest X-ray on the patient and it will be obvious that the patient has a left ventricular assist device. And here's an example. This was a uh, woman with congestive heart failure, coagulopathy, and abnormal liver function tests who needed an exam to evaluate for hepatic artery thrombosis. And here on the magnified view of the porta hepatis, you can see the portal vein and the hepatic artery um, separately. This is the signal that came from the main portal vein, and this is the signal that came from the main hepatic artery. And notice how um, venous this signal looks. This is because this patient had a non-pulsatile LVAD, and you just couldn't get a pulsatile waveform within the hepatic artery or any of the other arteries. Now we'll move on to the gallbladder. Um, twinkling artifact um, is a very useful artifact, um, but it can simulate um, true Doppler signal. Um, and can potentially be confused with real blood flow. And this is an example in the gallbladder of a patient that came in with an outside diagnosis of hepat or a gallbladder mass. And you can see on the grayscale image that the gallbladder is completely filled with what appears to be soft tissue. Now, most of the time, we would assume that this is just sludge. But when you get a Doppler signal from it, 
you say, well, gosh, maybe that isn't just sludge. Maybe that uh, is a uh, vascularized soft tissue mass. Well, the fact of the matter is this isn't true flow. This is twinkling artifact that's simulating flow. And the pearl in this case is that when you're dealing with twinkling artifact, the signal is very aliased. So you're going to have very highly saturated um, color Doppler signals. And also, if you try to take a waveform, it will be completely non-physiologic. You won't get an arterial or a venous signal from uh, twinkling artifact. And that's opposed to true uh, uh, masses, which will have um, detectable flow on, on uh, color Doppler, and the flow will be um, uh, linear, like vascular uh, structures, as opposed to little tiny dots of color, which is what you get with twinkling artifact. And then finally, when you do waveform analysis, you'll get a detectable um, signal that has a physiologic appearance. Now, dealing with the um, scrotum, there's a pitfall called acoustic streaming. Now, acoustic streaming is a mechanical, non-cavitational bio-effect that occurs because when waves travel through fluid, they transfer momentum you know, to the particles in the fluid and cause those particles and the fluid itself to move. This motion is always in the direction of the sound propagation. It occurs most prominently with the higher frequency transducers. Um, and particularly above 7 megahertz. And the motion um, velocity tends to be higher with color Doppler and pulse Doppler than it is in the uh, grayscale imaging mode. So the pearl in this case is to um, note that with acoustic streaming, the velocity is always constant and it's always away from the probe, regardless of what the direction of the probe is. So here's an example of a uh, spermatocele. On the color Doppler image here, you can see that there is a signal generated within the hepatic or within the uh, spermatocele. It's always a, uh, a signal that's negative because it's going away from the direction of the sound pulse. Now you can see on grayscale that there is some motion within the little particles within the spermatocele. But notice on color Doppler, where we've uh, turned color Doppler on, but we've um, suppressed the color Doppler signal, you can see when color Doppler is on that the particles move much faster in the Doppler mode than they move over here in the grayscale mode. Now, this doesn't just happen with spermatoceles, and it doesn't just happen in the scrotum for that matter. It can occur in any sort of um, fluid collection or cystic structure that has low-level internal echoes. And this just happens to be a case of um, a hydrocele that has some particulate matter in it. And you can see the signal both on color Doppler and this monophasic negative uh, signal on pulse Doppler. Now moving on to the aorta, um, there's an uh, artifact called mirror image artifact, which you're all very familiar with. It's very common with color Doppler um, analysis, and it can result in duplicated Doppler signals. Um, when that happens in an um, aorta that's had a stent graft, it can create a false positive um, impression of an endoleak. Now, the pearl in this case is that you need to view from different approaches. So, for instance, if this is aortic aneurysm with this stent graft within it, if you view it from an anterior approach, then the mirror image artifact will be immediately deep to the um, true flow within the lumen. Now, on the other hand, if you view it from a lateral approach, then the abnormal um, signal will continue to be located here on the opposite side of the um, stent. And on your image, it will look like it's right there, as opposed to a true endoleak, which would appear to be right here um, if you came from a lateral approach. Also, if you compare the waveform from the stent and um, the waveform from the artifact, you'll see that they're similar in size and shape, although they may uh, differ in intensity. So here's an example of an uh, endoluminal stent graph. And from an anterior approach, you can see flow within the stent, and then this mirror image artifact deep to the stent. When we come from a lateral approach, we would expect if, that was, if this was truly an endoleak, that it would occur over here on this side of the stent. But it's 
occurring deep to the stent again, and that's uh, typical of a mirror image artifact. Now we're going to move on to um, uh, some pitfalls that can occur virtually any place. And one of those is baseline ambiguity. Um, when the baseline is uh, moved to either the top or the bottom of the Doppler scale erroneously, a signal uh, can be aliased into the opposite side of the scale. And when this happens, it can lead to um, confusion in velocity measurements. So for instance, here's an arterial uh, waveform where everything is set up properly. The baseline is down at the bottom. The arterial signal is a positive signal, and when you measure this velocity, you get a velocity of 20 centimeters per second. Now, if the baseline was in the middle of the scale, then you would see that this is an alias signal down here, and you would recognize that this is not something that you can uh, measure from. If, however, you move the baseline all the way to the top, the entire signal is aliased, and if you don't recognize that, and you measure this as the uh, peak velocity, what you'll actually be measuring is this distance from the cursor to the baseline rather than the distance that you want, which is from the cursor down here. And in addition, you'll get a negative result rather than a positive result. So in order to avoid this, the pearl is to just don't move your baseline all the way to the top or the bottom of the scale unless you absolutely have to and then pay attention to the sign of the velocity. If you're expecting a positive velocity, you should have a positive uh, signal. If you're expecting a negative signal, then you should have a negative um, velocity. And here's an example. This is a tip shunt, where as you can see in the color Doppler image, the flow in the shunt is going away from the transducer. This is a negative signal. And when we measured this here, we got a velocity that was 48 centimeters per second but it's a positive velocity. And that's because the baseline is actually up here. The baseline is actually right up here. So what we're measuring in this case is this velocity rather than this velocity. Let's just show that um, a little bit more dramatically. So here's the abnormal uh, waveform. The baseline is actually right down here and so the, the distance that we're measuring is this distance, not this distance. If we move the baseline up to where it should be, then we're actually measuring the proper um, velocity when we put our cursor down here. And notice that it's a negative result rather than a positive result, as you would expect. Now, probe drift is another uh, potential problem. When you are doing a scan, it's not uncommon for your probe to change its orientation slightly or for the vessel to move slightly, um, particularly with the patients uh, uh, holding their breath, but not holding their breath terribly well. And this can produce non-representative waveforms and lead to inaccuracies in RI um, calculations. So as you can see with this waveform, as we start to drift, the flow starts to decrease um, um, gradually. So in this case, our eye should be measured here rather than being measured here because this is not representative of true diastolic flow. So to minimize this, just make sure that your diastolic closer cursor and your systolic cursor are close together and measure the um, um, in diastole and early um, systolic velocity rather than in diastole and um, systole from earlier in the cardiac cycle. And here's just an example. This is a waveform where we've got some slow drift in the transducer towards the end of the sweep. And notice that when we measure the RI this way, we get a measurement of 0.75. When we measure it here, it's a more accurate RI of 0.68. So this is really the way we should be doing our RI measurements to avoid any chance of probe drift. Um, this is not the correct way. Now another pitfall in measuring uh, resistive indices is when your Doppler scale is too high. When you have a very high Doppler scale and a resulting small waveform, minor changes in cursor placement 
can lead to large differences in RI measurement. So you should never try to measure a resistive index or velocity for that matter when the waveform is this small. Adjust your Doppler scale so that you've got a nice big waveform to measure from and then small changes in your cursor placement will have very minimal change in um, uh, velocity measurements and RI determinations. So here's an example. Here's a, a waveform that's been obtained at a relatively low Doppler scale. And what I've done is place two different cursors um, in diastole and systole. And notice that there's very little difference in the height of these cursors. And it's the, the height that's important in measuring resistive indices. So they're very close together. And with a waveform that's this big, the resulting difference in your RI measurement is very small, 0.73 and 0.72. But when your waveform is really small because of a high Doppler scale, small differences in cursor placement have a more dramatic effect on your RI measurements. And in this case, the RI changes from 0.75 to 0.67. So from an abnormal uh, result to a normal result. Now another pitfall that can cause uh, problems, primarily in determining flow direction, is aliasing. So on color Doppler, aliasing will produce a wraparound in your um, color assignments. If you look at the Doppler scale here, when you alias, the wraparound is going to go from the um, high frequency shifts to the low frequency shifts. But true flow reversal will occur, and that, will, and, and that by the way, will produce a, a transition between the very um, um, yellowish reds and the uh, uh, greenish blues, depending on what your uh, Doppler scale um, or your Doppler map is um, like. But it will cause color changes from here to here. When there's true flow reversal, it occurs from the lower frequency shifts on either side of the baseline. And your transition will be from the dark reds to the dark blues, and there will be a little black line in between because of the um, low, uh, low uh, frequency filter. So here on a tip shunt, this is aliasing, which is very obvious because of this color transition. And this is true change in flow direction, as you can see um, with the little black line between the two and the change from dark red to dark blue. Now aliasing is actually a useful artifact. You can see, in this case, this uh, highlighted an area of stenosis. Um, but if you're trying to eliminate or diminish aliasing, you can increase your Doppler scale. And then also in, in um, determining what's um, flow reversal and what's aliasing, just pay close attention to your color transitions. And here's an example of a, a splenic vein. Um, on uh, a high Doppler scale, plus or minus 20, you can see that it looks like it's going in the normal direction. Um, antegrade towards the portal splenic confluence. But when we decrease the Doppler scale, there's enough aliasing that this can really simulate flow reversal. So pay attention to that when you're uh, uh, using color Doppler to determine flow direction. Here's an example of a, a tip shunt where the Doppler scale is so low that we've got so much aliasing artifact that it's wrapping around multiple times. And you just get this mosaic appearance um, on color Doppler. Now when you readjust the Doppler um, scale to a more appropriate value, you can see that the flow looks much more uh, normal in this tip shunt. Now with pulse Doppler, aliasing induced um, wraparound can uh, cause confusion in analyzing the um, signal. And here's an example of an arterial waveform from a dialysis shunt. Now with a relatively high Doppler scale, everything looks fine. As the scale is dropped, we start to see some aliasing here um, below the baseline. But this is typical aliasing and is easy to recognize. As we continue to drop the Doppler scale, we're starting to get more overlap and wraparound of the arterial signal. And this is becoming a little bit more confusing. And then finally, if we really drop the Doppler scale, there's complete overlap of um, arterial um, systolic and diastolic flow. And this looks completely uh, uh, non-physiologic. So this type of a waveform um, would be difficult to analyze um, unless you increased your Doppler scale. So the pearls are increase your Doppler scale. Since the uh, Doppler frequency shift 
is proportional to the transmitted frequency, decreasing the transmitted frequency will also um, uh, minimize aliasing. Um, so that's something to attempt as well. Now, when you're uh, measuring um, acceleration or when you're um, trying to recognize parvus tardis changes, the sweep speed is important. Um, with respect to acceleration measurements, minor changes in cursor placement can lead to very large differences in systolic acceleration when the sweep speed is slow. So, for instance, here we have a sweep speed where we've got multiple um, um, cardiac cycles kind of all crowded into one sweep speed. When you're measuring acceleration, uh, which is the systolic upstroke here, the slope of the systolic upstroke, um, this is uh, uh, going to give you an inaccurate acceleration. What you really want to do is to speed up your sweep speed so that the signals are stretched out. And at this point, minor changes in these cursor placements won't affect your acceleration measurement as much. So here's an example. Here's an uh, arterial signal that's been obtained with a slow sweep speed. When we measured the um, uh, acceleration twice, and you can see there's two cursors here in systole and diastole, the difference ranged from 200 centimeters per second to 500 centimeters per second. And that's for just minor changes in these cursor um, placements. Now, with a much faster sweep speed, these minor changes in cursor placement result in much less inaccuracy in um, acceleration measurement. I also realize that just subjectively, um, when you're analyzing for parvus tardis waveforms, that the sweep speed will make a difference. A fast sweep speed, like is illustrated here, stretches out the arterial um, um, signal and can give you apparent parvus tardis effects even when they're not uh, there. So this certainly looks like a blunted signal um, when it's um, at a very uh, fast sweep speed. But if we slow the sweep speed down and look at the exact same signal, it looks much less abnormal. So the pearl in this case is when you're subjectively comparing waveforms, for instance, the upper and the lower pole of a kidney or the right kidney and the left kidney, you should do it with similar sweep speeds. And here's just an example. This is a waveform that you might think is uh, abnormally blunted, has a parvus tardis type of appearance um, when viewed at a very fast sweep speed, but looks much less abnormal when viewed at a slow sweep speed. Uh, next, let's talk about tissue vibration. This is an artifact that occurs when there's turbulent blood flow. Turbulence cause pressure fluctuations in the lumen of the vessel, which can cause the vessel wall to vibrate. This vibration can be transmitted into the perivascular soft tissues. Um, now, this is actually a useful artifact on color Doppler, but it can, con it can uh, cause confusing uh, appearances on pulse Doppler. So here's the effect. Turbulent blood flow, in this case due to a stenosis, causes vessel wall vibrations and then vibrations in the soft tissue, which then give you this type of a Doppler signal um, in the soft tissues. Now, on a pulse Doppler, the tissue vibration will result in a very high intensity but a low amplitude signal. And that's shown here on this um, image where we're actually sampling the tissues next to a dialysis um, graft and astomosis. And notice that the signal is very bright because it's coming from um, soft tissue interfaces. Um, but it's not very um, high because these uh, vibrations aren't occurring at a high velocity. Um, now, as you can see here, this causes symmetric signal above and below the baseline because the reflectors in the soft tissues are moving back and forth rather than just going in one direction. Now, this may be isolated if you put your sample volume over the soft tissues, um, in, as in this um, anastomosis area here. But here's an example of a renal artery stenosis where we're sampling from the artery itself. And you see the arterial signal here and the very high velocities due to the stenosis. But also notice that buried within this arterial signal is a uh, uh, signal from vibrating soft tissues. So it's not nearly as high, but it's quite strong 
because um, it's coming from soft tissues rather than red blood cells. So the pearl in this case is to correlate your Doppler signal with your color Doppler image so that you don't confuse tissue vibration for true um, vascular flow. And then when this happens, increase your scale um, until the arterial signal is um, clearly identified as discrete from the um, tissue vibration. So here's an example. This is a femoral artery, um, AV fistula. And you can see what looks like a vascular signal here. But this is actually the tissue vibration. Notice you can see vibrating tissues on the color Doppler image. And the true arterial signal is all of this signal up here, which is hard to recognize because it's been aliased um, at the, um, at the uh, limit of the positive Doppler scale, and it's wrapping around now into the negative scale. So you can see how this can produce a, uh, a problem. Now finally, um, one particular pitfall that we all encounter all the time is um, with respect to Doppler sensitivity. You're examining a vessel, you're trying to show that there's blood flow present, and because of sensitivity issues, slow flow, et cetera, you just can't quite do it. So remember, that you need to adjust your Doppler parameters to increase sensitivity. So with respect to the Doppler scale, it should be decreased. The Doppler gain should be increased. Doppler angle should be decreased. Transmit frequency, in most cases in the abdomen, should be decreased. Wall filter, decreased. The packet length, that that's available on your unit, should be increased. And the sample volume should be increased. The one that I really want to emphasize is your transmit frequency. I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, cases where we haven't been able to detect flow in a vessel because we're um, transmitting at too high of a transmit frequency. And here's a good example. We're looking at a transmit frequency of 3.3 megahertz, and we can't see any flow in the main portal vein in this patient that's had a tip shunt. When we drop the transmit frequency down to 2 megahertz, flow is readily detectable despite the fact that no other changes have occurred in the technical parameters. So that concludes this uh, lecture on uh, pearls and pitfalls of abdominal Doppler. I hope this will help you in your day-to-day -day practice as you um, um, go forward and um, do your abdominal Doppler examinations. Thank you very much.